my name is Ivica, and as, as he said, I will be talking about defining an abstract architecture for managing unstructured data using MongoDB, and I will showcase uh, our, our main product, which is the vDrive. Uh, before I begin, uh, uh, last time I uh, last time I presented the paper, uh, I started off with a joke, and it was either a tough crowd or a bad joke, but I won't be trying that again. Uh, on the other hand, uh, since gamification is, is all the buzzword these days, uh, throughout uh, my presentation I have hidden uh, three puns or jokes or references, or whatever you, you want to call them, and whoever uh, uh, guesses those puns will have a chance to, to win this awesome cupcake, it says. <laughs> I, I believe it, it is awesome, really. Okay, uh, this is the, the outline of, of my paper, of my presentation. Uh, I will uh, start off uh, by explaining what digital libraries are and uh, how they influenced this paper. Uh, next, I will be talking about data uh, in this context uh, where, while handling digital data. Uh, uh, the main portion of this presentation uh, will be uh, talk about MongoDB, which all, all of you heard of. Uh, the next part, uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, the vDrive, uh, maybe some testing uh, and uh, conclusion in the end. Okay, so uh, let me begin. Uh, I believe that uh, we can all agree that uh, knowledge access and knowledge sharing is a really important part of uh, contemporary classrooms and, and modern uh, modern uh, institutions, uh, teaching institutions. Uh, considering the importance of uh, knowledge, knowledge sharing and knowledge access among students, uh, it is a, uh, important that a system, uh, information system which handles this uh, is well built, that it is highly available and a scalable system. Uh, also, we can all agree that uh, every information system uh, should have a disaster recovery scenario. Uh, in, the, in the recent, in the past years, uh, more than a few digital libraries uh, lost content due to, to floods in India. Uh, there was a tornado in Texas and a few earthquakes in Indonesia. So uh, all, all three of those uh, university libraries lost content because they uh, didn't implement a disaster recovery scenario. Uh, when, uh, when we talk about uh, digital libraries, uh, we, we assume that they handle digital content and uh, uh, a basic uh, disaster recovery scenario for, for uh, huge amounts of digital content is to uh, simply copy the data on a distant location which is uh, on, a, on a, uh, another tectonic plate or uh, 300 kilometers away and so on and so on. Uh, there, uh, there are currently uh, two or, or maybe, maybe more approaches that handle digital, digital content. Uh, first, uh, both of them uh, have their flaws. Uh, the, those uh, approaches are uh, either using relational databases or using file system based repositories. And both of them, as I've said, both of them have, have major flaws. Uh, these flaws may not be uh, visible from the start. You, you start using the system and it's, it, and it's working great. And then you need to add another server. You, your uh, current architecture does not support, uh, doesn't support any more data. So you uh, either add another server or you add more, uh, more hardware, uh, hardware power. So you basically vertically scale the system. Uh, you go out and buy uh, a more expensive uh, processor. You buy more HDD, HDDs. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that you can uh, add only so much uh, power to an existing server. Uh, so, uh, these are the cons of the current approaches. Uh, first of all, it's, it's really expensive, and you know how, how uh, economy is these days, so no money for the IT whatsoever. Uh, if, you, if you decide not to scale up your system, there is a, only a finite amount of data which you can store uh, in your architecture. And what happens when the usage patterns change and w or if the server load changes? Does that mean that, that your uh, hardware is underutilized? So you wasted money, basically. Uh, when, uh, when I say data, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean two types of data, basically structured and unstructured data. Uh, structured data is basically uh, all the data that you can fit uh, in a table or in a table-like structure, basically what you can see on, on this example. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is uh, unstructured data, which is basically everything else. 
all the PDF files, all, all the uh, emails, all text files, all movies, that's all unstructured data. And uh, there was a, a recent study in 2012, I believe, uh, which shown that more than 80% of all the data uh, in small and medium uh, medium uh, enterprises is actually unstructured with a tendency to grow. So there is a real need for a system that handles unstructured data efficiently. Okay, uh, while while we were uh, while we were uh, researching uh, uh, some some cool stuff, we came upon we stumbled upon MongoDB. Uh, MongoDB is a NoSQL high-performing uh, distributed database, which it, it was built in, in 2007 by TenGen. Uh, it is a document-oriented database, which means that uh, the data uh, is, is saved inside of uh, BSUN documents. BSUN is basically a binary encoded JSON, so it's, it's human-readable, but it's also binary data. Uh, MongoDB is, of course, free, free and open source software. Uh, they have very nice documentation on their official, official website. There are also uh, free online courses and so on and so on. I, I don't want to, to be a marketing guy. Uh, on the, uh, next, next to all that free stuff, uh, there are also uh, drivers for, for main, uh, main programming languages, uh, namely C, C++, C Sharp, uh, Java, Node.js, PHP, Python, of course, Ruby, and so on. There, are, there is a support for, for more uh, languages. Uh, this, uh, this slide shows a little comparison uh, of relational databases and MongoDB. Uh, in this example, on the, on the left-hand side, uh, we have uh, data that is written into rows. These rows are organized into tables. Tables are grouped into databases, and each table has a primary key. Uh, in, in addition to that, uh, tables have relations between them uh, using the, the foreign keys. Uh, on the other hand, MongoDB uh, stores data inside of documents. That's how they call them. Uh, documents are grouped into collections, and uh, the, this is the, the first uh, difference between uh, SQL and MongoDB. Uh, when you have an, a, a SQL table, uh, the data inside that table is highly structured. So the structure is imposed uh, on the data. Every field has to be uh, there. Every field has to be present. Uh, on the other hand, MongoDB does not impose structure uh, on, on documents. So uh, each document inside of a collection can be different basically can be different. It, it's logically sound to, to group similar documents, but they don't have to be exactly uh, the same. They don't have to have the uh, same fields. Uh, as, as in the SQL world, uh, collections are grouped into databases. Uh, there is a, some, some implementation of a primary key, which is the, the underscore ID field. And because there are no relations between, between collections inside of a single database, uh, there are a few ways to, to model your data, and, and one of those uh, ways is to use nested documents. So basically, a uh, document inside of another document uh, is, is similar to foreign key relations in SQL world. Uh, this, is a, this is a simple example of a document which, by the way, uh, uh, describes me. Wow. Uh, as, you, as you can see from the top to bottom, uh, there is a underscore ID field, which is the primary key. And the data type of, of that field is, uh, is a special uh, data type called object ID. It's, it's a MongoDB defined uh, data type. And as I've said, from top to bottom, there are, there are various uh, data types, such as strings, uh, integers, arrays, uh, date, time, and there is a, a nested nested uh, document company, which is inside of a parent document. Uh, there are uh, three main features uh, for which we chose MongoDB. And the first one of them is replication, which I'll explain in a couple of minutes. Uh, replication, as you may, uh, may, may know, is uh, basically copying the data to multiple locations. Uh, it's it's very it's a uh, automatic method, and it brings redundancy and high availability to your uh, cluster. Uh, there are a few 
uh, roles inside of replica set and the first and, and foremost role is the primary server. So it, it's uh, marked with a P. Uh, the, the primary server is uh, responsible for all the write uh, operations that the cluster receives. So each write operation goes to the primary and secondary servers marked with, the, with an S uh, replicate that data automatically from the primary. Uh, there is also a, a built-in mechanism called the heartbeat, uh, which is basically like a ping, and it is triggered every two seconds. So each server in the cluster basically pings all the other servers to determine if, if they are up and running, if they are alive. Uh, so in a situation where a primary server goes down, what happens? Does that mean that, that your cluster is uh, unavailable to receive new data? Well, yeah, uh, but, uh, but that, uh, there is a slight delay, maybe 10 or, or 15 seconds. I will, I will demonstrate it a little bit later. So there is a delay uh, because the other secondary servers will figure out that the primary is down and they will hold an election process. Basically, each uh, server has one vote and they cast the, their vote for a new primary and then a new primary is elected and the cluster just goes on performing like, like it did 10 seconds before. Uh, replication is also a, a perfect setup for disaster recovery because uh, you may uh, decide to move one of your secondary servers to another location, to another building, another city, another country, it doesn't matter, it's, it's all uh, done online. Uh, in addition to that, there's more, uh, in addition to that, those secondary servers may be configured uh, so that the data can be read uh, from them, basically uh, uh, lightening the load on the primary server and thus creating a redundant, highly available cluster. Uh, when I say high availability, it's only fair enough, fair, fair for me to explain how uh, would you plan high availability using MongoDB. Uh, as I've said, there is an election process which is uh, held each time a primary server goes down. Uh, majority is, uh, is a really important concept when, uh, when uh, we talk about replication because uh, majority, uh, sorry, uh, let me explain majority. It's, it's really simple. Majority is basically half, half of the configured set plus one server. So if you have uh, three servers, majority is two, as suggested in this table. Uh, why is majority so important? Uh, it is really important because uh, your primary server can uh, stay primary as long as, it, uh, as long as it maintains majority. So if, if the primary can contact uh, more than half of the set, it will remain a primary. Uh, another, another important uh, internal mechanic, uh, mechanics of replication is the priority. And priority is a user-defined uh, preference or simply a number between a zero and 100. And it it's, uh, shows your preference towards a, a particular server because of its, uh, I don't know, hardware uh, or, or its network connectivity and so on. Basically, every server that has a higher priority will uh, most likely become the primary. Not most likely, will definitely become the primary. Um, let's, let's plan a little, little high available cluster. Let's do the math real quick. Uh, let's say that you want to, to plan a cluster that can handle two servers, two, two offline servers. Basically, uh, it's, it's all about majority. So uh, you need a five server cluster because if you lose one, then you lose two servers. You still have three servers available. You still have majority. So uh, the, the whole replica set, the whole cluster will continue to function even though uh, two servers are offline for any reason. And if you replace those servers, nothing will change. Everything will, will continue on working as, not, as if nothing happened. Uh, one major danger that people just seem to or forget or, or I don't know what, uh, they all assume that replication is a backup solution. Replication is not a backup solution. It is not. What happens when someone, uh, when someone runs a query that removes everything from the database? Well, yeah, 
secondary servers will replicate that query and everything is deleted. That, that's, it's not a backup solution. So a proper backup procedures are uh, important even though. Okay, uh, I have planned a little demonstration, sorry, to, to show you how how replication works. Uh, there, are, there are three virtual machines set up on, on my laptop. Uh, just uh, real quick, oh, okay. <sighs> Terminal console, yeah. Okay, as I've said, we have, we have three servers, and as you may see from top to bottom, this, this line that says secondary, secondary and the primary. It is what it is. So uh, there are three servers. One of them is primary, and there are two secondary servers. Uh, I will now, I will now, I will now query this this database. These are the collections that I that I talked about. Uh, some of them are system collections, some of them are uh, user created. And let's just... Okay, we have zero chunks. So the database is empty. There is only a collection because I, I did a couple of writes to the database. Uh, I, will now, I will now run a custom uh, Python service and I will upload a file to this database. Let it be a 20 megabyte file, we don't care. So, while it's uploading, and here it is. Uh, it, uh, the, the upload is finished, and as you can see, uh, this is the, the, the IP address of the primary server. Okay, I will now query the database uh, once more. Here is the file. So it's uploaded. As you can see, there, there are a few, few uh, informations about the file, uh, such as file name, uh, its length, or the size, and the hash. Okay, I will now move to Another server, which is uh, a, a secondary server, as you can see, it says uh, secondary. I will now just do some magic. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Everything should work. I don't believe it. Uh, something went wrong. Sorry. It, uh, it, uh, this, this wasn't planned to go like this. We, we actually have uh, our servers back, back at my school, but the VPN <laughs> server went down. It's broke, so I can't use that. And these virtual machines are not so great. I don't know why everything, everything worked yesterday. You, you, you know that. All, that's, it's always like that. Ah. I, this is what I wanted. So, uh, <laughs> I have now queried after all these tries, I have now queried one of the secondary servers and as you can see there is a file uh, which, which wasn't there a moment ago. So, uh, the file replicated from the primary server successfully. It's, all, uh, it's, it's replicated to all the secondary servers. Okay, 
uh, I will now uh, I will now shut down this uh, this primary server to see what happens with the cluster. Okay, the server is now shut down, and if I check the status of of my cluster, you can see that it's currently not reachable. So the primary server is currently not reachable. I will now try to re-upload the file. And it works. But if you noticed, this line here changed. So uh, what happened here? There was an election while I was talking. The election process kicked on. And the, the cluster chose a new primary server, which now takes the role of writing the data to the whole cluster. So nothing really changed for the end user, only sweaty, sweaty forehead. But nothing actually really changed. Everything works. It, it just works. It's magic of MongoDB. OK, let me, let me continue. I won't start from the beginning. Okay, uh, another great, great feature of MongoDB is a sharding, and sharding is a method uh, for storing data across multiple servers, across multiple machines. Uh, it basically splits the data uh, to a few shards. Uh, uh, this, this mechanism, this uh, sharding is very useful for load balancing and also scaling. But when I say scaling, I mean uh, horizontally scaling uh, your whole cluster. It basically means that uh, uh, when you run out of storage or if you run out of processing power for the, for the sheer amount of data, uh, you can just add another server. You just put another shard, configure it real quick like I, like I just did, yeah. And it will, uh, there is a, a background process which will uh, transfer uh, a certain amount of data from existing shards to the new shard, uh, thus uh, balancing the load on all servers. Uh, MongoDB is not uh, the first database to support sharding, of course, uh, but MongoDB uh, does it a little bit different. What they did is, is next. Uh, they added uh, additional servers. So this is a schema of a sharded cluster. Uh, what they did, they added uh, uh, routing servers, and they, their role is, as their name suggests, they route queries uh, from the client application to the appropriate shard or shards, uh, because the data can be split among multiple shards. Uh, there are also uh, config servers on, on the left here, as you can see, and uh, those config servers uh, store the whole configuration of, of the whole cluster uh, in, in their own database, and they are responsible. Uh, they, they are responsible to know where each chunk of the data is. So the client application only queries the routing servers. It does not need to know how many shards is there. It, it's completely oblivious. It only queries the routing servers, and the routing servers then go out and split the query to two additional shards as needed. Uh, it's also important to, to say and to know that uh, these uh, shards are uh, a replicated environment. So each shard is a replica set. Uh, the, the third feature that I really personally like is a GridFS, and it is a specification for storing uh, files which are larger than 16 megabytes. Uh, basically, BSAN documents can store 16 megabytes of data, but if you need uh, a bigger file, if you need to store bigger file, there comes the, the GridFS. Uh, GridFS can be c considered a database file system. Uh, it works by... Uh, splitting uh, the file in 256 kilobyte chunks, and those chunks are written in a special collection, which is called chunks, FS chunks. Uh, there is also a, a special collection called files, which I queried uh, in, in my demonstration. And that collection holds all the metadata about a file, uh, such as file name, file size, uh, upload date, and so on, and so on. Uh, and uh, 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 MongoDB is actually uh, uh, like a skeleton to, to our research, to our product, and GridFS is basically the, the spinal column, column of that uh, skeleton. 
Uh, it's also important to, to know when to say that uh, MongoDB uh, streams, it, it does streaming uh, uh, both when you store the files and when you read the files also. So it's a streaming uh, environment and it also bypasses uh, file system and operating system limitations on file size. You can basically store uh, any file size as long as you have a, a proper hardware, of course. And a short while ago, in a school not so far away from here, uh, <laughs> uh, one of the, my, my colleague, my dear colleague and uh, co-author of this paper, Milorad, from, from uh, the audience, uh, came, uh, he came up with an idea. Uh, uh, we have a, a information system in our school which is uh, like a one-way communication channel between teachers and students. Uh, teachers uh, use it to, to grade their assignments and papers and to, to input uh, grades. And uh, students on the other side uh, log on to the system and they just read out their grades and that's all they can do basically. Not everything but basically the, the main part. So he came up with, a, with an idea to, to extend that information system uh, with uh, a hardware software plugin, basically, that handles unstructured data. And uh, we figured to use it uh, for the students to upload their assignments, to upload their files on, on our own school servers. They, each one of them should get one gigabyte of space. Basically, a cloud within our school. It, it was supposed to work that way, and it will work that way. Uh, while we were developing uh, that solution called the V Drive, uh, we we stumbled upon an idea to uh, create a uh, abstract architecture that will uh, be an addition to every information system, extending it with uh, unstructured data handling capabilities. Basically, you go, you buy a two or three used servers, you install our product, and there you go. Your information system should be extended and expanded with uh, unstructured data handling capabilities. Uh, the first and foremost condition was uh, that this system should be very low cost or completely free for the user. And it should also possess a uniform communication interface, so it could interface with almost any, any existing information system. So these are the conditions that we, uh, that we uh, figured we should uh, fulfill. And on the left hand side you, you can see the condition and on the right hand side is the solution to that condition. So we, you, we built a, a RESTful web API uh, which uses JSON as the communication format. Uh, in order uh, for the system to be with minimal expenses or possibly free, we of course used, used uh, open source technologies. And for uh, end users, ease of use and setup, we automated the hell out of it and put a web interface. Everything is simpler on the web, so they say. Uh, this is a, a outline of the proposed architecture and it consists of base system, database layer and a service layer which, which communicates with the DB layer. Uh, for the base system, as you may have noticed, uh, we used custom CentOS uh, minimal distribution. Uh, which comes with all the batteries included. Uh, MongoDB is in installed automatically. Uh, the, your hard drive is partitioned automatically. I will show you that in, in a little while. Uh, all the custom services that we built are built in and everything is up and running in no time. Uh, also, uh, the, we built that distribution to provide a uniform experience for administrators and users someday in the near future, uh, when this system becomes uh, popular, I hope so, uh, you, you could just say, oh, I'm using that custom CentOS and every administrator will know, yeah, those services are running and these ports are open and everything is working. And it's also plug and play with, ma, look, no hands. Uh, the the uh, installation is completely, o completely automated. Uh, we've used a CentOS as a feature of kickstarting uh, which is basically a predefined set of, of answers to those basic questions. What will be your password? What's the, the partitioning scheme and so on? And this is the, the proposed partitioning scheme. Uh, as you can see, there is a boot partition, a root partition and a var partition. 
which is the largest one, and it, it will grow uh, to the maximum size of the hard drive because MongoDB uses uh, VAR partition as its repository. It stores data on the VAR partition. Uh, for the web API, we used Python, of course, big heart for Python, and it's Tornado framework. Uh, because Python is, is built in into every Linux distribution, it's very easy to uh, read and to understand and, and to use, and it also comes with uh, lots, of, lots of good features. Uh, to, to boost it up, to, to put some steroids in it, we used the Tornado framework, which is a asynchronous uh, data-driven, I don't know the, the words that they describe the tornado in. It's basically a very, very nice piece of software. It's really fast. It's faster than Node.js, all of you. It's really, it's, it is faster than Node.js. Yeah. And to, to conform to a, a RESTful architecture, we used HTTP, basic HTTP methods such as post, put, delete, and get. And this, this is a, a, a example. Uh, how would a client application, whatever it is, uh, how it would uh, create another user. Basically, it would uh, make a post request as, as written and provide uh, basic data about the user and that's it. A, a nice response is also returned from the API. Uh, as I've said, and if you recall, uh, MongoDB does not impose structure on its documents. So each document can be different. And it's, it's really nice if you have a, a web scraping robot or, or something, or, or a logging application, something like that. But uh, when you were building a business application, you want it to behave just as you envision it. You want to put some rules into it and you want to impo impose those rules as much as you can. Uh, so we decided to use uh, this uh, Mongo engine library, which is a uh, Mongo driver on steroids, basically. And it provides, uh, it's, it's a Python library, of course. And it, pro it provides the user with an ability to uh, define documents using Python. As you can see, this, uh, these are two documents that I've defined. And it's the same document uh, that I showed you an example of. So it's a user document with a company embedded into it. And it's, it's really a real simple Python code. There, there's not much to it. That's it. Uh, for, for the hardware part of this whole architecture, uh, we used uh, two Fujitsu RX300 servers, which we had just laying around, making noise. Uh, with the with the current, with those specifications as written, and we basically used uh, each one of them as a separate data center. So we we quote unquote created two data centers. Uh, each of those data centers had uh, VMware uh, virtualization technologies on it, and we created a sharded environment in order to to test this whole approach and this talk, this this whole research. Uh, it's, it's also, the, the picture is color-coded, so it's easier to understand. Uh, we basically created a two-shard two shard cluster. Each shard had a, a three servers. And on the first data center, we put two servers, so uh, one primary, one secondary. And on the other server, we put the second secondary of first shard. Confusing? No, it's not. Uh, and we switched places with, with another data center. So the second data center uh, held another shard, which was also a replica set, and those, those additional servers that, sharded that sharding uh, environment requires. And in order to test this whole, whole approach uh, that we devised, uh, we uh, basically thought about it, and uh, the, the f file sizes that we use should correspond to uh, expected file sizes that our students will upload. So there, are, there were 5, 25, uh, 50, and 100 megabyte files. Uh, and for the first round of testing, we copied those files manually over the, the local network and over the, the internet. And uh, those results are in, in red and uh, uh, those results are in, sorry, those results are orange. So manual copying is orange. Uh, then, we, then we created a replicated, uh, replicated cluster and uploaded the same files, the same file sizes. 
and the measured time. So those, those times are represented in blue. And as you can see, there is not much difference. So MongoDB does not uh, bring, uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't add uh, any, 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 I forgot the word. So it, there's no additional time. Uh, when you when you copy the file manually, there's no overhead. That's the word. There's no overhead when you when you use uh, MongoDB's replication mechanisms. It's, it's just as fast as copying the file manually. Uh, we also tested this solution over slow slow links. So we used a, a VPN which was limited to for, to two megabits per second. It, it was really slow and awful, uh, but it 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 just works. Everything works. No matter, no matter that the, the, the speed was very slow, it worked. And uh, same as before, there was no significant difference between manual copying and uh, Mongo's uh, integrated replication mechanism. So, to conclude, uh, there is a great need for systems that handle unstructured data as shown in the introduction slides. Uh, the solution that we provide uh, using MongoDB and GridFS is efficient and is uh, scalable to gigantic proportions. Actually, there is no data size limit that you can hold in a, in a sharded environment, so no data size limit. And also, there is a disaster recovery scenario, which is a bonus feature that, that comes for free. And I will now thank you for your time. I, I'll just rehydrate myself and you think about questions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the election, uh, there is, a, maybe I forgot to, to mention, there is a built in mechanism called the heartbeat. And that heartbeat mechanism is basically like a ping. It pings every two seconds, every server pings all the other servers. And uh, if the, the pinging server, the one that sent out the ping, doesn't receive a response in 10 seconds, uh, that server is considered to be down for any reason. Maybe it's not down, maybe the, the, the network connection broke, but there is no connection between them and it's considered to be down. So the... the yeah? Yeah? Yeah, the majority is two. Yeah, but you have to two servers. Yes. Uh, both of them, both of them uh, uh, propose the, themselves to become the primary. And uh, I, there is uh, maybe some simple math, maybe some complex math that determines which one will become the primary. Uh, the, the stuff that I know is that a server can become a primary only if it has uh, the latest data written. There is a, a, a last write time actually in the logs and the one that has the latest uh, written data or has the highest priority will become the primary. If all the servers have, have the same priority, one of them will become uh, the primary. It doesn't matter. Uh, one, with the data. one with the latest data, yeah, yeah. If they both have the same data, then it, it really doesn't matter which one. Yes? It happens at, uh, every 100 milliseconds. So, so it, it's almost automatic as, as, yeah, sorry. Does that mean that all the servers hold all the data? Yes, uh, they hold the same data set. It's not like sharding where, where the data is split, but the same data set is held on, on every server. Uh, I forgot to mention, uh, there is a, a user configurable uh, delay for replication, so you can configure one server to be delayed, uh, let's say, four hours. So that server will will be late four hours to replicate the data, always. Sorry. Yes. You mentioned that uh, replication and uh, sharding is in no way replacement for for a backup. backup. So yeah. Uh, yeah, we actually we did not implement because we we had no yeah we we're guilty but we had no hardware to to support that we only had two servers. Okay, but if you had, uh, yeah, yeah, there are the, that you 
Yes. Uh, there are there are built-in uh, tools tools to back up your uh, single server or the whole cluster. It, it comes built-in with MongoDB. It's Mongo export and Mongo import. Uh, those those two tools. Yes, yes. There's something to to dump. Sorry, to dump the data. Uh, those backing up to, to automate, well, cron cron jobs. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Any uh, yes. Uh, yeah, with the write operations, yes. Uh, read operations. Oh, let me sorry. Let me show you the the, the schema. So all the write operations will will target the primary server. And the way that your client application knows uh, which one is the primary, uh, basically, uh, when you, you build an application, there is a connection string. If you, if you ever use databases, there's always, always a connection string which you use to connect. And you basically uh, put all the servers in the connection string. So it's string this big. And the driver itself will know which one which server is the primary, and it will also know if that server is down, and... So the read can come from the secondary Yes, if you configure it that way. There is also, there is always a, a inconsistency between the data on the primary server. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there always is an inconsistency. It's, it's a uh, trade-off. You choose to have a highly available cluster, but your data will not always be consistent. If you, if you upload large files to the primary server, and those files uh, didn't have enough time to replicate on the secondary, the secondary will not have those files. It's, it's as simple as that. Yeah, I, I'm not uh, very much versed, uh, versed with, with Hadoop. I've never used it. Uh, the, the things that I've read is uh, Hadoop is, is like a, it has a bunch of tools, and each tool is uh, for, for a certain role. MongoDB comes with all that uh, built in, so everything is out of the box. I, I'm sure that, doesn't, uh, that uh, my answer is not an answer to your question. So I, I really don't know. It's quite similar, actually. Yeah? The replication and the rollback of the data and the quite of, a lot of interesting stuff. So I just yeah? thought maybe you could No, no, I've never used it, no. Thanks. We actually use the MongoDB because it, uh, it has a, a elastic search capabilities with, with a plugin, actually. We, we needed that. And also, it, it uh, supports uh, large files. Maybe Hadoop also supports them. We don't know. We, we didn't use it. Yes? Uh, if all the servers have all the data, then yeah? if we have a lot of data, we really need a lot of powerful machines. Uh, they don't need to be exactly powerful. Uh, MongoDB runs on, uh, as they say, commodity hardware. We basically used, uh, for, for our testing, we used machines that were more than 10 years old. They were uh, Celeron machines with 512 megabytes of RAM and uh, 20 gigabyte hard drives. And it, it just worked. Maybe it, it wouldn't work uh, if the, the amount of data was too big, but uh, there, uh, you don't need uh, all that powerful servers. Those can be used, uh, and, and actually commodity hardware. It's commodity. Any more questions? Okay, I thank you again for your time. Oh, thank you. What about, what about the cupcake? What about the cupcake? Where multiple stuff is like, oh, is that a joke or is it for real? <laughs> Everything is a joke and for real. So, did any of you catch any, any puns, any fun stuff inside of my presentation? Yes. There yeah? Was, uh, there was a school in a school not so far away. That's one of them. <laughs> so, that's one. You have two more. Oh, it, was, it, it wasn't a reference to anything. 
Okay, but I'll, I'll give you one, so you have one also. Yeah? Um, hobbies, cats. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it's real, I, I really like cats. Oh, maybe I did it too hard. So you, you have one. It's a Star Trek reference, of course. Uh, there were also two references, so I'll get the cupcake, sorry. Uh, there was a, ah, no, I, I closed it. There, there was a reference to a Unix epoch, the, the start of Unix time. In the table, 1970, yeah, that's, that's the second reference. And that is, what's that? That's the end of a Unix epoch. Nice one, Chaba. You win the cupcake. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! Nice one. There you go.